go forward with our last speaker in this panel. Um, he is joining us here in Berlin, um, Viken Chiterian. And um, Viken um, is a lecturer in history and international relations at the University of Geneva and Webster University um, in Geneva. And he will talk about um, war, genocide, and remembering in the modern Middle East. Viken, the floor is yours. And this is just in okay. case no photo uses it. Thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers inviting me, including me in this event. Very glad to be back here and work with, with all of you. Uh, missing Rolf, as, as we all remember him. Me, I will talk about these issues, about the war, about um, the First World War, uh, the mass violence committed, the genocide, and remembering uh, in the modern Middle East. And I will start by talking of uh, an exchange, a debate I had um, three years back uh, with uh, a Syrian intellectual, Yassin al Hajj Saleh, those of you who, who might know him. He lives now in Berlin. Um, so the debate started with, um, with an article he published uh, on the site uh, Al Jumhuriya, the Republic, which uh, is, no, is one of the founders of this site, one of the Syrian intellectual uh, dissident uh, uh, forums where uh, interesting debate is taking place. And um, the, um, the article was about denial of genocide, Inkar al-Ibada. And um, there was a short introduction by uh, al-Hajj Saleh, and the, the body of the article were translations that he made of parts of a book uh, of Adam Jones, Genocide, a Comprehensive Introduction. So he had um, translated into Arabic certain segments about denial of genocide. Um, in, in his introduction, uh, al Hajj Saleh was arguing that the Arabic term usually used, uh, ibada, extermination, is not the precise term that is suitable to be used uh, for, for the subject matter. And instead, he Arabized the expression genocide. Now, me um, looking at this uh, article, I felt that there was a whole dimension missing and that there was a debate necessary to engage. Now, before moving on to, to my uh, kind of engagement in, in this debate, I would like to say a couple of words about who is Yassin al Hajj Saleh, because I think it's important. So as I said, he's uh, a major Syrian uh, dissident intellectual. I discovered him through his writings in uh, a major uh, pan-Arab newspaper, Al Hayat, during the, the first uh, years of the Syrian uprising. Basically, for me, he was the brightest and the most interesting uh, Syrian dissident to, to read, to understand what was happening in Syria in 2000. Uh, 11, mainly 12 and 13. Uh, Yassin al Hajj Saleh uh, was born in Raqqa in northern Syria. And as a young uh, student in Aleppo, he was arrested for his political views and activities. He was engaged in one of, one of the left wing uh, parties in Syria. And he spent 16 years, 16 years in Basis prisons. Um, Later, during uh, the, the, the uprising in Syria, he was underground and later escaped in 2013. But uh, many members of his family suffered enormously. Uh, his wife was um, kidnapped in late 2013, uh, most probably by, by one of the radical Islamist militias in eastern Damascus. One of his brothers was uh, kidnapped by, by ISIS and so on. Uh, I personally met uh, Yassin al Hajj Saleh twice in Istanbul um, and had discussions with him. 
So personally, I have enormous esteem to his intellectual engagement and enormous respect to his personal suffering in Syria before and during uh, the war there. Um, my article here uh, that, that we see, how do you say genocide in Arabic, is basically an invitation to think about why for oh, nearly one century, uh, Arabic intellectuals were not interested and engaged in the question of genocide. And the fact that the term genocide, uh, Yasin al-Hassalah needed to borrow from foreign language, in this case, from the Canadian writer, Adam Jones, revealed that there was not only lack of uh, literature about this event, but also lack of conceptual engagement. Therefore, we needed to borrow concepts and Arabize from, uh, from abroad. But there was a second, more fundamental issue for me, which was uh, you know, at stake here, is that um, the richest history of genocide denial is the case of the Armenian genocide. There we have 100 years of material about denial of genocide, ways of denial of genocide, and consequences of genocide denial. So I was uh, surprised that um, Syrian and Arab intellectuals had been for so long indifferent and therefore did not produce the necessary um, conceptual, but also historiographic uh, engagement with the Armenian genocide. And in my article, I argued that um, there was direct uh, relationship between the genocide of the Armenians and you know, uh, a number of post-Ottoman Arab states, including Syria, uh, we know that during the, uh, the genocide of the Armenians, there were more than 20 concentration camps, they were called as such, uh, in what is later, uh, what later became Syria. Uh, we know that the second stage of the Armenian genocide took place exactly in what is today uh, Syria, in Deir ez-Zor, in the deserts of Deir ez-Zor, where in, um, in 1916, uh, the the surviving deportees were massacred. Um, and, and therefore, I argued there should be direct interest from Arab intellectuals and, and historians in those events that took place in, in their land. Uh, just to, to, to give some, some elements here, um, 870,000 deportees, mostly women and children, arrived in what is now Syria in the second half of 1915. Men were already killed. As you know, uh, the, the deportees were divided between men on the one hand and women and children on the other, and men were killed either at the exit of their villages or towns or in 33 localities in what is now southern Turkey. Uh, so those 870,000 deportees that arrived uh, to what is now Syria, 630,000 of them were, were, were killed or died suffering from uh, lack of food, water, or from diseases. So um, to give some uh, numbers, uh, in the town of Al-Bab, which is uh, a locality north of Aleppo, uh, according to uh, Raymond Keborkian, in his monumental work on the Armenian genocide, he says that between 50 and 60,000 uh, deportees have been buried in Al-Bab, a town in the, in, in the northern, of, northern part of Syria, which is today under Turkish military control. Um, Raqqa, the, the birthplace of al Hajj Saleh, uh, had a very interesting history of its uh, concentration camp, which survived longer uh, up to 1917 in interesting circumstances, but eventually the deportees there were also killed. 
And as I mentioned, in Deir Ezzor, uh, in 1916, those who had survived uh, were massacred in what Kevorkian mentions uh, or uh, coins that as the second stage of uh, the genocide, where 192,000 uh, surviving deportees were massacred between July and December of that year. So how come this monumental event was not seen by Syrian intellectuals and is completely absent from Syrian historiography? Uh, moreover, if uh, an intellectual, a dissident intellectual and who, like al Saleh, who is trying to understand the events in Syria, the mass violence there, through the uh, concepts of genocide and therefore consequently genocide denial, uh, the reason why he was translating these texts, uh, then there should be some interest in uh, this denied past of also Syrian uh, history. Um, my suggestion was why this, this monumental event was not seen, is that um, Arab nationalism that basically uh, wrote, uh, narrated modern history of Syria, of Iraq, and the region, considered what came before them, before the independence of Syria, as something outside the scope of Syrian history or Arab history. Uh, Ottoman period was seen as a period of Turkish occupation of these lands and therefore irrelevant in understanding modern Arab history. So in this uh, I ideologized history of the Middle East, Turks, Ottomans, but also Armenians and the Armenian genocide were outside the scope of uh, relevant historiography. Now, to, to my article, uh, Al-Hash Saleh answered by the use and misuse of genocide denial that you can find on the internet, on the site of uh, Al-Jumhuriya and have a look. And his basic arguments were that, again, as uh, I mentioned, and very similar to what uh, Fatma Mugegecek said earlier today concerning modern Turkish historiography that starts with 1919, and uh, what, what is there before is very ambivalent, belongs to the Ottoman past. Again, uh, Yassim al hash Saleh argued that uh, there was no Syrian entity at that time, hence explaining the indifference uh, towards those events. He um, minimized uh, Arabic implication in those events, saying that it was incidental, and uh, whatever Arab involvement in those events that, was, that is largely ignored and not uh, researched by historians, um, he argued that uh, there is no, um, it was incidental and that uh, it would have made no difference in the outcome of the genocide. He closed down the debate by saying there is no discourse, there is no issue or discussion about the matter. And then al Hash Saleh uh, accused me of focusing too much attention on group identities and, and fixating group identities, Armenians, Arabs, and so on, Turks, and so on. And that, to understand uh, genocide and genocide denial, it's better to concentrate on such uh, issues as um, the state and international affairs and historical contexts. He concluded his article by saying that, I fear that Chetarian's treatment encourages the path of relativity and the competition of victimhoods. So I, I also answered to, to Hash Saleh, if it is interesting, you can have a look. That's not the point here. What I'm trying to say here is that we have, uh, I discovered, a fundamental different understanding about the history of the Middle East. Uh, for me, the events in the First World War were directly relevant to understand why in the post-Ottoman Middle East, 
we have a culture of mass violence. Or rather, I, I had posed this remark in a form of question, uh, what were the consequences or what are the roots of current mass violence in the Middle East? And whether the past mass violence that had happened in that land was not a relevant issue to be considered, which for al Saleh was outside the scope of relevant history of modern Syria. Um, the way the modern uh, history of the Middle East has largely been structured uh, was by thinking about a very fundamental break with the Ottoman past. Uh, the Ottoman past was for long decades not relevant, both conceptually and uh, in the in narrating historical continuity between before 1918 and after 1918. This break became even more difficult because of the concepts uh, that were used in establishing and narrating, narrating the modern history of the Middle East. Me, I would argue that the last edition was the term genocide that al Hajj Saleh translated from uh, English source to Arabize it. But I would argue that notions such as nation, state, secularism, progress, socialism, social class, etc., are also concepts that came from the outside and they were, they were used by both foreigners, orientalists, we call them today, but also by local uh, actors, those historians and scholars who constructed the modern history of the Middle East. And by using these concepts that were essentially borrowed from Western uh, context, incidentally, they came by the colonial powers, didn't they? By the French and the British uh, who came to rule uh, those post-Ottoman Arab lands between the two wars. So those concepts came with the colonial uh, state that was mentioned just before me, uh, and they were used to narrate this history. And by doing that, they created a conceptual break between the Ottoman world and the way it was organized and the post-Ottoman world that emerged in the form of nation states. Just to pick one example, uh, how useful is it today to use the notion nation when we look at the modern history of Syria, uh, Syrian independence, when, where we saw the amount of internal violence exercised by the Syrian, Syrian state against its uh, population, different segments of its population. Uh, and if uh, a nation does not have basic uh, form of solidarity, and if a nation has such internal violence, then how useful is it to use the notion of the nation to understand the history and the developments in, in, uh, in Syria, for at least for the last 10 years. So um, I, I think the, the conceptual break is very important to understand. And, and therefore, this puts in front of us a huge effort to not only link the Ottoman past with post-Ottoman realities, but also to have a critical approach towards our conceptual and theoretical framework uh, that, that was uh, adopted in the modern uh, historical uh, narration of the Middle East. Of course, denial is a, a second very important element. The Armenian genocide was denied, and this denial is not just uh, coming from the state, that is the Turkish state, there are different forms of denial, and in, in uh, other places I have argued that uh, the most difficult part of denial uh, is the one that comes from non-state actors, and specifically from social groups and ind uh, individuals who belong to uh, cultural, uh, intellectual, and political uh, groups outside the state, and specifically uh, opposition forces, that continue either to, to follow the de denialist discourse or to ignore 
the to engage uh, in major subjects such as genocide and genocide denial within a given society. And finally, I would argue that post-colonial studies did not help uh, in this effort. Post-colonial studies, uh, of course, pioneered by such a figure as Edward Said, puts the accent of uh, the research um, about the history of the Middle East uh, in outside the scope of the Middle East. So uh, Orientalist writers uh, become more important and what they write and what they say about the Orient becomes more important and therefore criticizing uh, colonialism and imperialism and Orientalists becomes more important than uh, analyzing and, and understanding local forces, uh, local contradictions, local struggles that eventually shape the history of the Middle East. So if you look at the writings of Edward Said and his students, there has been no genocide in the Middle East. And I think this is a problem. Um, this morning, it was said already by Stefan Erik that uh, in the last years, there has been some very interesting research done about the, the Armenian genocide, we know much more about it. And some um, scholarly disciplines have embraced this subject. Of course, it starts within the very uh, small and minority discipline of Armenian studies. Later on, uh, it was taken over by Turkish and Ottoman studies. Today, it's making its way in um, Holocaust and genocide studies. Yet, in the mainstream, historiography, it's, it's a footnote. Uh, you might remember some years back, um, we commemorated the centennial of the First World War, and there was a large number of books published about the First World War. If you look at some of these books, you might notice that uh, at best, and I underline, at, at best, the Armenian genocide is a footnote. Um, maybe a paragraph or two and some references. It's not part of our general analysis and understanding of the First World War and that uh, the largest number of civilians were massacred in the Ottoman lands, uh, which was not the case on, um, in, in the other areas of European battlefields. Um, I would say the same in the mainstream uh, historiography of the modern Middle East, when you look at major books, there too, either the Armenians, their past, and their absence is not there, and at best, it's a footnote. Um, I, will, I will jump on, on, on this, on, on Sykes-Picot, on Lausanne Treaty, uh, to, to come to, to one historical figure, just to illustrate how much this break of concepts and this break in histori historiography is uh, deforming you know, the, the, the major historiographic narratives of the Middle East. Uh, those of you who know uh, the modern history of Syria or Lebanon, you might know this figure, Yusuf al-Azmi, uh, a military officer who led the Syrian troops to fight against the French colonial armies uh, coming to occupy Damascus uh, in the famous Battle of Maysalun. So Yusuf al-Azmi, he was the defense minister of uh, Prince Faisal. And although uh, Faisal was against this battle, uh, al-Azmi with some of his soldiers and officers uh, engaged in this battle, uh, he was killed there. And since he is celebrated as a national hero in, in Syria, as uh, a Syrian and Arab hero. Uh, now, if we look a bit at the details of his uh, biography, we see that probably Yusuf Lazme did not define himself, neither as Syrian nor as Arab. And although he had joined uh, Faisal's troops, probably one year or two years before he was fighting Faisal's troops as an Ottoman officer. In fact, he had made uh, a career in the Ottoman army and uh, this page of his, these pages, you know, what, what he did during the First World War uh, we do not know about. We know that he was uh, a deputy of no one uh, else than Enver Pasha. We know that he has been on the Caucasian front. And uh, what else do we know about him? 
uh, and that in the last year of the war, he was the commander of the first Ottoman army. So uh, it seems that um, Yusuf Lazme was much more of an Ottoman uh, officer than a Syrian nationalist or an Arab nationalist, uh, which is absent from uh, modern historiography of, of, of Syria. Uh, but more than that, what, what uh, I'm interested in is to see al Azmi and many, many other officers like him uh, who later became the, the backbone of modern uh, Syrian army or modern Iraqi army, what they were doing during the First World War. What did Yusuf al-Azmi experience uh, with his uh, boss, Enver Pasha? Did he see uh, massacres? Uh, did he take part in some of the deportations and the killings of Armenians or Assyrians or Greeks? So, um, to move on uh, on conceptualization of mass violence and to, to come back to the example of Adam Jones's book that, that we started with, we see that we have major problems in conceptualizing what happened during the First World War and how to define group identities. Adam Jones, in his first edition of, of the book we mentioned, he has a chapter on the Armenian genocide. Quote unquote. In the second edition, uh, five years later, the same chapter is the Ottoman destruction of Christian minorities. So was the conflict between the Ottomans and the Armenians an ethnic conflict or was it a religious one? Here, the question you see is open. To conclude very quickly, I said already that um, we do not know so much about the Ottomans because we narrated a very uh, I, uh, idealized and ideologized uh, history of the Middle East. Yet, when we look at the fundamental debates taking place in the Middle East today, we see that many of these issues were raised more than 150 years back in the Ottoman Empire itself. During the Tanzimat period, the question of rule of law, the question of group identity, the, the question of state's identity were all debated and certain uh, solutions and were proposed by the Ottoman reformers uh, and, and so on. Therefore, linking th th this historical debate is not just a question of historical past, but it's a question of um, of also contemporary politics. Second, I would say that uh, the last three decades of the Ottoman period, and especially the, the emergence of this mass violence and the, the way uh, it emerged, which was absent from previous periods of Ottoman history, uh, is still relevant to understand uh, contemporary Middle East and the mass violence taking place there. Uh, and finally, I would insist that um, to understand genocide and its denial, it is not enough, as Hajj Saleh was arguing, to, to focus on the state and its actions. It's not enough to talk about foreign powers and uh, international context, uh, but sub-state social groups and organizations, uh, their ideologies and their, their uh, way of mobilization their way of defining in-group and out-group is very important. Otherwise, contemporary violence in the Middle East, for example, the Yazidi uh, genocidal violence that Daesh, ISIS, exercised against Yazidis in 2014 would not be understood. I think I exhausted my time. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions and remarks. Thank you. Stay here. Okay. Um, yes, uh, again, thank you for this uh, very interesting um, uh, connection because, I mean, it, it circles back to Muge's prehistory um, thesis of, of Turkey and you transferred it to the Middle East. This is very um, interesting. But I want to start with Adam Jones. Um, I only have in my bookshelf the 2001, I guess, was the first edition, some, some around that. And, uh, and I wondered, how, why did he change it? I mean, Armenian genocide and then Ottoman 
history, uh, Ottoman, um, what was it, extermination or, or violence against of Christian, Christian minorities? Yeah. What, what, what's the story behind this? Uh, this is a little bit strange. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, we should ask Adam Jones. My yeah. answer would be that there are two, two elements maybe that, that can help yeah. uh, in, 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 in um, arguing why the change. Uh, I think in the past we had largely focused on the destruction of the Armenians in, uh, in the period of 1915 uh, uh, up to uh, um, the establishment of, of Kemalist Turkey. And uh, increasingly, we saw that it was not the only community that was targeted by mass violence, yeah. by deportations and massacres, yeah. uh, that there are two other communities at, at least, if not others. Uh, for example, in uh, many localities in southern Turkey, uh, of southern Tur Turkey today, um, uh, you cannot distinguish the violence exercised against Armenians on the one hand and Assyrians. So uh, if you talk about only the Armenian genocide, then you are excluding the Assyrians. Um, therefore, we need, uh, of course, we also know that uh, a, a third community was also targeted by deportations first, uh, and later in, in the case of the Pontic region, uh, deportations and, and mainly massacres. So how to uh, look at the, the event as a whole? not just as a singular event targeting Armenians. I think there's an attempt to, uh, to see the, the three case studies as part of the same historical process mm -hmm. uh, and therefore the, the change in the title. Maybe a second element would be that uh, in the last 20 years uh, in the Middle East, we saw that the religious question has made a comeback. Mm -hmm. First by the political Islam and in the last 20 years by the emergence of uh, confessional mobilization, mainly Shia Sunni uh, religious uh, mobilization. So I think uh, this adds to contemporary concerns. Is there a link between the, uh, the, the events in the First World War and the emergence of religious radicalism later on uh, and so on? I think there's more than one element that can explain this, this shift. I mean, I, I understand if we, if we focus um, on, on different victim groups and, and say, we somehow group identify him through their religious affiliation, but I'm I'm a little bit um, a suspect of this kind of that we don't shift in the old paradigm that it's it was a religious primordial conflict. You know, I mean uh, the the violence um, in the in the Middle East and the Armenian genocide because it's um, born out of um, uh, modernity, um, uh, the, the the Young Turks modernity concept. Um, uh, of a of a new let's say of, of a new Vatan, uh, of a new fatherland so and that that's why i ask i mean it's because it's i mean if you speak about genocide you always must be i think very sensitive with the with the language and not to imply these these only underlying religious um uh conflict lines that's, why not why, why are you afraid of and let let me argue of, why. I'm, I'm, not, no, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm only afraid of if it's only just a, a single cause um, explanation, which then um, is, the, is, is, is the final result of this discussion. And I think if, yeah. we, if, we, if we say we have the religious aspect, we have the aspect of modernity, of a, of a state, of, of a homogeneous um, nation, which is different from, um, let's say, one religion um, fights against another religion. Um, so if, if we have these different levels, I agree. And, um, and uh, I think it's important. But language always have, it ways, have, uh, have the ways to maybe in the end produce um, a single moment of, um, uh, of acknowledgement or of, 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 of thinking about things. So th this is the only. We must be cautious. That's the only thing I want to say. If we if we talk about it, that we have the dif different um, levels. So that's that's why I wondered because um, you also could just um, interpret this kind of um, uh, different um, headlines with a, a different met me approach to the question of the Armenian genocide. That's but I don't know. I mean, as I said, I only have this. Uh, the first edition in my bookshelf, so so I will see what he's um, writing um, 
in the third one because it's very interesting. But anyway, I mean, he was that I must say um, he was one of the first Adam Jones who tried to system uh, uh, systemize um, the, the the question of genocide. Yeah. Okay, there is oh oh yeah. Um, we have something first. We have I don't see it in uh, Müge. If you hear me, um, uh, could you could you write it in the chat or could you? Put it on again because. Oh, you can say it, yeah, Mugo. You will be live again too. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, we can, uh, <laughs> yeah. for that wonderful uh, presentation. I think, and also to Michael and before this one. I think the crucial uh, part here is who basically has power in civil uh, society in terms of remembrance. And I think we have to look at uh, the concentration of power, I mean, eventual concentration of power around the nation state and the sort of official narrative. Uh, and that is the narrative uh, that is selected and continues uh, basically today at the expense of the remembrance of, I think, uh, the local communities, uh, the religious uh, communities, so to speak, that you talk about. So I think what is crucial in both uh, uh, Michael's and then uh, Vikan's presentations uh, is the significance uh, of uh, the nation state um, and the state specifically in determining uh, the contours of uh, remembering uh, because of the power they wield in civil society. It's not, you know, until very recently that these uh, religious communities could directly attach themselves to the larger social media and have their uh, version of uh, what happened be heard. Uh, but as until we talked about it, these are all, uh, both Michael and we can say, episodal. I mean, if it's episodal, that in a way demonstrates, I think, the strength of the nation state in determining what is remembered and what is not remembered um, is what I would argue. I don't know if you agree with that, we can. Thank you. Um, maybe first, what, what Roy, you mentioned about the religious dimension. Me, I think the religious dimension is very present in the Armenian genocide, but in, in, of course, not in a primordial sense, in a very modern sense. And that's why I think those events in the, in the First World War are very relevant to what is happening today in the Middle East. Because the way the Ittihadists imagine their identity, it is based on an imagined uh, ethnic uh, identity, which is not there because they are ethnically very diverse, right? Uh, they are not just Turks. There's, you know, uh, among Ittihadists, there are Albanians, there are Kurds, there are Cherkes, there are Macedonians and so on. But what unites them is uh, the millet identity in the, in the sense of the ruling millet. It's the, it's the Ottoman structure that, that, that should be analyzed and understood to see how they imagine the transformation of the Ottoman Empire from an early modern empire to a modern nation state. What they understand is that we cannot include in our new modern nation state project those uh, non-Muslim millets, we tried, we failed, they became too rebellious, too rich, too pro problematic. And what they want to do is to get rid of them and eventually to create the modern Turkish nation state based on the pre-existing uh, Sunni community in the Ottoman Empire. So the religious dimension is there, but in a very modern sense. And me, I understand this as the failure of uh, secularization that the Ottomans tried to do during the Tanzimat reforms. So it's this failure of creating a secular state, detaching religious identity from political identity that eventually recreates this uh, modern national identity based on the Ottoman concept of uh, social division. And I think this is very relevant to what is happening today in countries like Syria, in countries like Iraq, where we see in the late 20th century, the re-emergence of confessional differences. 
I can agree with that. Yeah. Okay. If we if we if we, if we cut out the primordial dimension, yeah, yeah, sure. which was uh, which was um, present in the early um, uh, research on the amino genocide in the eighties and nineties. So, yeah. but okay. So Muges' question or comment on that, and then I have one um, uh, from the chat as well. Okay. Uh, for for um, uh, Muge, I, I understand very uh, very much what you are saying. The state is central. But then when we look, for example, in the case of the Armenian genocide within Turkish society in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when we see that uh, even uh, individuals, uh, intellectuals and political formations like uh, the Communist Party, even they, they are not uh, ready to, to, to embrace the question of what happened to the Armenians in spite of the fact that they had uh, different Armenian members uh, in their party and even in, in their leadership. So I think the challenge for me is uh, is not to explain state denial. That's that's easy. You know, it's visible. You can uh, calculate. You can measure. But this state denial is not possible without wider societal participation in denial, and that's more difficult to explain. Okay, so Ronald Suni joined us. Hi, Ron. Um, he asks in the post, um, Nakba years, how has the concept of genocide been used by Arab intellectuals or movements, Palestinians, for example, and do they use it parallel with the Armenians? Um, Take it up it way. Yeah. Yes, um, thanks for the question because this brings uh, more precision. Thanks, uh, Ron, for this. Uh, it is interesting to see how in the period of Arab nationalism and Arab leftist uh, movements, um, Armenians were seen as allies. Uh, and Turks were seen as the other, as the enemy, member of NATO uh, in alliance with Israel. And Armenians were seen as you know victim of this NATO country plus Soviet Armenia and so on. So there was this uh, two camp division of the world in which the Armenian, uh, especially militant organizations were identified as part of this global third worldist struggle. Uh, and uh, therefore uh, the Palestinian and Armenian struggles were seen as parallel. This part of history today is completely lost. Uh, in the Arab world, you, ha you have this uh, confessional division on the one hand, you have the mainly Islamist Sunni forces uh, that see themselves in alliance with Turkey, Turkey as protectors against other uh, dangers and enemies. And for them, the Armenians are you know, uh, outside the scope of uh, their history. So Armenians are just bothering Turkey with this fake history of genocide. On the other hand, there are the others. Um, for example, uh, Bashar al-Assad in, in, in Syria, uh, who is uh, opposing Turkey and fighting Turkey. Therefore, Armenian genocide is used within the limits of propaganda to say that Turkey is bad and therefore uh, mobilize minorities, Christian minorities and others against Turkey. Why not Kurdish uh, groups and so on? So um, in, in both cases, my argument is that uh, the history of this period of the Ottoman Empire, the last three decades, decades of mass violence, is not integrated within the mainstream narrative of the, the Arab Middle East. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Vikan. Um, so if there are no more questions from the audience here or from you at home or wherever you are watching the live stream, there's one, Johannes, please. Hello, my name is Johannes from Germany. Um, my question is, the Armenians, the Armenian community in Syria uh, was very big and is still in a good, uh, 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 has a um, high number, but in, in the past it was much bigger. How is it possible that uh, the, the history, why they came to Syria and uh, is, 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 is not included in the, in the society culture and the knowledge about uh, the, the, in the society in Syria? And uh, was it what? What is the uh, what was the role of the Armenian or the Armenian community in Syria since then and now? Um, so to clarify, 
the, the history of the Armenian genocide is not denied in Syria. Right? It's, it's, it's there. There are books, Arabic books written about it. Uh, there are Armenian churches. Uh, there was a huge monument to the uh, victims of the genocide in Deir Zor, which was destroyed during the war by, uh, by ISIS. Uh, so I'm not saying that the history of the genocide is denied. It's simply ignored. So it is there. It belongs to the Armenian minority. It's not part of Syria history. Um, and more than that, what, what is denied is the question of what Arabs did uh, during the genocide. So the only uh, history uh, uh, that is kind of tolerated concerning Arabs is that Arabs uh, received Armenians and they were generous towards Armenians. So the question of whether certain Arab tribes participated directly or indirectly in violence against Armenians, this is censored. Uh, although we know that uh, there were thousands and thousands of Armenian uh, children, women, who were taken in one way or another within uh, Bedouin tribes, especially in, in Northeast Syria, and that uh, in the early uh, 1920s, uh, Armenians bought back these uh, hostages, slaves, or, or in, in some cases they were saved. Saved. I'm, no, I'm, uh, I don't want to generalize one or the other. But simply what I want to say is that all this history of mass violence that exists on the land of Syria is simply out of the official historical narrative. Um, if I may, I would ask another question. Um, how is this transition made by that um, uh, the genocide 1915 um, made, uh, made the, uh, yeah, in, in, in 2006, 12, 14, the Yazidi genocide was uh, repeating. And how is this transition from a nationalist or a nationalist uh, slash religionist genocide in 1915 uh, coming to, uh, to, um, to uh, societies in which are right now, uh, or groups or organizations, and who are still continuing to try to uh, homogenize the Middle East uh, in the same kind, and how is this transition made? How, uh, how is this ideology transformed to their ideology? It it must be a line or something, in or is is no connection between them? Um, as as I try to illustrate through the example of Yusuf Al Azmi, uh, is that uh, we do not know many questions because we didn't do the historical research and uh, and analyze it. Uh, for example, one way of looking at uh, the continuity between the, the late Ottoman period and post-Ottoman uh, societies is the way society is structured. We called Syria, Syria. We, we thought that there's a Syrian nation, but maybe within this community, these this, uh, boundaries, uh, people were organized differently. And today we discovered that it was a fact. People were organized differently. You know, solidarity, mobilization, um, in-group, out-group identity, fear from the other is, is understood totally differently compared to concepts of nation, nation state, uh, social class, and so on. Um, but um, I'm especially interested, again, with the example of Yusuf Al-Azmi, uh, specific institutions such as the army. I think the army uh, in late Ottoman period after 1908 uh, during the genocide, but also in post-Ottoman Turkey, Syria, Iraq, played, continues to play a very important role. And there, maybe there are some changes, but there are many continuities. Uh, there's institutional memory uh, and so on. And all these questions uh, have been largely ignored uh, in the history of the Middle East. So we have a lot of work to do yeah. in this field. Yeah, thanks again, Vikin, for this um, survey. And yeah, I'm a little stunned how much work um, there has to be done in the future. So, I mean, we're um, concluding for now um, with this last um, talk by Vikin. And tomorrow we will go on with two panels, more focusing on the question of humanitarian help, humanitarian organizations, and international justice. Um,